Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Groden. I'm a cardiologist and heart failure specialist, and I co-direct the UT Southwestern Multidisciplinary Amyloidosis Program. In this short topic, we'll be discussing how we diagnose AL and ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. I have a number of disclosures, and those are displayed on your screen. And the outline of this short discussion is as follows. We will be discussing key differences between AL and ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. We will then transition to cardiac amyloidosis type specific diagnostic testing. And then we will end with a diagnostic algorithm that might be useful to you to help put it all together in clinical practice. So before we get into type-specific testing, it's really important to recognize that amyloidosis is caused by a number of precursor proteins. And we think, or we think that there are at least 36 known precursor protein types that can cause amyloidosis, but only a portion of these protein types might affect the heart. We think that number is about 11. So now you think that this might sound like a really daunting task, but it's actually quite straightforward because the overwhelming majority, approximately 95% or more of all the cases of cardiac amyloidosis that we see boil down to two causes. That is to say they are caused by either AL amyloidosis or ATTR amyloidosis. Really with the remaining 5% or fewer are caused by very, very rare types of amyloidosis. Now for the rest of this discussion, every time you see the words or the letters AL, I'm denoting light chain amyloidosis. And every time you see the letters ATTR, I'm denoting transthyretin amyloidosis. Now, when we think about these two diseases, I think it's really key that, that the hearts really don't look all that different. Now, these are two gross specimens uh, of hearts from an uh, from autopsies of an individual with AL amyloidosis, and then another individual of ATTR amyloidosis. And really what's striking is that these look almost identical. We see a lot of ventricular thickening, and it's really hard to tell these two diseases apart. Now, when we think about how these diseases act, they are completely different. Now, these are some survival estimates of different types of ATTR in comparison with AL. Now, what is displayed on the y-axis is median survival. So median survival is the time at which 50% of the population with which you started is no longer alive. And you can see when we look at ATTR wild type or a number of other ATTR genotypes, we can see that the median survival is estimated in years. Now, when we contrast that to a patient who is diagnosed with AL cardiac amyloidosis, their median survival might be as little as five to seven months without treatment, making this diagnosis crucial. So AL amyloidosis is a diagnostic emergency. And I tell a lot of my referring physicians that when you think about amyloidosis, we have to think about AL first because the disease is very aggressive. So what is AL amyloidosis? Now, these are some data, uh, and, and they're probably a little bit outdated. We think it might be more common, but there are over 3,000 new cases a year. Although the incidence does go up with age, I do have a number of individuals that have this disease in their 30s and 40s. And as I mentioned before, AL is far more aggressive than ATTR. And as I said, also early diagnosis is crucial. So what is the cause of AL amyloidosis? So there is an abnormal clonal expansion of plasma cells in the bone marrow. And these are cells that normally make antibodies that are dominated by heavy chains and light chains, so large complex proteins. So when a patient has AL, we see abnormal plasma cells that are making light chains and they're making light chains like crazy and then they start to aggregate in circulation and cause amyloid. Now let's pivot to ATTR and this ribbon diagram shows the what ATTR, what TTR looks like circulating in the blood. So TTR is a blood protein that is made in the liver 
we think about 99% of TTR in the body is made in the liver and about half to 1% of the TTR in the body is made in the choroid plexus of the brain. Now, the word transthyretin is a portmanteau of the word, the words transports thyroxin, which is thyroid hormone, and retinol. And it does so by complexing with retinol binding protein 4. So as it turns out, it's really not all that important for the delivery of thyroid hormone to the rest of the body, but it is important for the transport of vitamin A throughout the blood. Now, this really comes in two flavors, either an acquired form or wild type form or a hereditary or mutant form. And you'll either see it as hereditary ATTR or what we're commonly using now as variant ATTR or ATTRV. And when we talk about the pathological abnormality of this disease, it's really this tetramer. So this ribbon diagram, each color dissociating leads to amyloid formation. Now let's pivot to some amyloid type specific testing. We have free light chain assays, and these will really be the cornerstones of how we diagnose this disease. Serum and urine immunofixation, bone scintigraphy in the United States, we use technetium pyrophosphate, and then of course, tissue biopsy. Now, when I tell my referrings or my residents or my fellows is that if you order one test for a patient with amyloidosis, make sure you check their serum-free light chains. An abnormal serum-free light chain ratio is 91% sensitive for diagnosing amyloidosis. <laughs> now, when you see that we combine this with serum and urine immuno, or, or immunofixation, you can see that the sensitivity for diagnosing AL amyloidosis goes up to 99%. So now when we talk about serum and urine electrophoresis, that's SPEP and UPEP, these are relatively insensitive tests and uh, really have very low sensitivity and specificity. So a negative SPEP and a negative UPEP does not rule out AL amyloid. You must check serum-free light chains and you must check immunofixation. Now, what about a non-diagnostic test that is type specific for ATTR? And in the United States, we use bone scintigraphy or we use bone scintigraphy with a tracer, I should say, that we use in the United States called uh, technetium pyrophosphate. There are a number of other tracers used in other countries but are not approved by the FDA. And it's a very straightforward test to uh, use. So if you look at these four images that I show on your screen, we have different grades of uptake. And if you look in the area of the heart, we, we grade this uptake as it is relative to bone. So if we see the panel on your left has grade zero uptake where we do not see the heart, this is ATTR negative. If you look at the panel just to the right of that, we have cardiac uptake, which is less than bone. This is grade one. This is also ATTR negative. And then if you look at the third panel to your right, we have where the cardiac uptake approximates bone. This is grade two. This is positive. And then we contrast that to the panel all the way on your right, which is grade three uptake, where the cardiac uptake is far greater than bone. This is ATTR positive. Now, what is key is that you must use this test once you've ruled out AL amyloidosis and the sensitive or the specificity and the positive predictive value is so high if you've ruled out an abnormal M protein that this can achieve a non-biopsy diagnosis of ATTR amyloid. Now, nowadays, we also pair this with SPECT imaging, and this can enhance the specificity of this test. And what I'm showing you here in the panel on your left, you can see these areas of brighter orange seem to be inside the myocardium. So this is what we call the blood pool, where you look at this dark gray horseshoe around it really doesn't have any uptake at all. Now we contrast this to a true positive test where we do see all the bright yellow orange makes a horseshoe pattern, which denotes that the uptake is in the ventricle. This is a true positive. And then finally, uh, organ biopsy or tissue biopsy really is crucial to diagnosing this disease. Uh, so this is, we think, 99% sensitive for diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis, specifically an endomyocardial biopsy. We do this in the cath lab. 
there is, of course, a 1% risk of perforating the right ventricle. Now, what is important is if uh, the samples stain positive for amyloidosis, they must then have another test to specify the type of amyloid, either with immunohistochemistry or mass spectrometry. And then a quick word about fat PET biopsy. This is used in a number of centers. This can be 60 to 80% sensitive in AL, uh, perhaps a similar in hereditary ATTR, but really not all that sensitive for wild type ATTR. Now, there are a number of issues with this test. It can be dependent on an operator, pathologist, uh, expertise, and then also the amount of tissue that's actually collected. So as it turns out, really a negative fat PET biopsy does not rule out cardiac amyloidosis. It can help you if it's positive, but because of these testing characteristics, it might not help you if it's negative. And so how do we put this all together? Well, let's say we've built our clinical suspicion of cardiac amyloidosis with a number of, with either clinical signs or a number of nonspecific uh, cardiac amyloidosis techniques. Um, then it is imperative to check or to do a workup for an abnormal M protein with free light chains, serum and urine immunofixation. Now, if we have an evidence of an abnormal M protein, then we have to go straight to biopsy. We cannot secure a non-biopsy diagnosis of this disease. And largely we're thinking about AL in that case. Now, if our free light chains or our urine immunofixation is normal and we have no evidence of an abnormal M protein, then we can check bone scintigraphy. If our PYP scan, at least in the United States, is positive, the person has a non-biopsy diagnosis of ATTR, and then we move to genetic testing. Now, if we have ambiguity or the PYP scan is negative, then this person has they either don't have amyloidosis or they might need a biopsy if our index of suspicion is still otherwise high. So, and I think a key thing to remember is if there's ambiguity in any of this testing, this should always trigger consideration for an endomyocardial biopsy. So, and then a quick word about genetic, test uh, genetic testing. So specifically, if you've diagnosed ATTR, TTR gene sequencing is recommended in all cases of TTR-related amyloidosis. Clinical grounds and family history are limited. Most people don't have the recall, uh, or they might not be aware of family members, or there can be ascertainment bias uh, where those patients in their family or the people in their family might have never been diagnosed. And I will also mention that even when we biopsy, sometimes mass spectrometry can tell you that there is evidence of an abnormal TTR variant. This must be confirmed with TTR gene sequencing in all cases of ATTR amyloidosis. So this concludes our short discussing our short discussion on differentiating AL and ATTR amyloidosis and how we diagnose them. Uh, I really want to thank you for your attention. Goodbye.